Hi everyone and welcome to Insights. My name is Kevin McGarvey. I'm a professor of English here at Cumberland County College and my guest today is Dr. Charles Kocher. Dr. Kocher uh, was a member of the Camden Police Force for 30 years, rising to the rank of Deputy Chief in 1998. His father was a Camden police officer as well for 27 years, rising to the rank of Lieutenant. Dr. Kocher came to Cumberland in September 2000. He was instrumental with the changes that advanced the criminal justice program here at the college as far as the diverse program offerings we have, and he also planned and implemented the first online degree for justice studies at CCC. Dr. Kocher, thank you so much for being here, sir. Thank you. Dr. Kocher, you have uh, written a book. And you have just published a book, which is a marvelous book, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I have read it Thank a couple you. of times now. And it's called Camden Police in Defense of Law and Order. So the title alone, I have, I have two questions for you. Does law and order need defending? And what is the significance of the title itself? Well, the significance, uh, Kevin, uh, goes back to an incident that occurred in the 1960s where the city of Camden lost two patrol officers in less than a minute's time. They were both part of a two-officer car patrol and on a call, and there was a domestic, and the one officer bolted from the car and was shot by the suspect uh, just at the moment that a second patrol car arrived to back up the first, and the suspect turned and fired and shot the officer in a second car. So in less than a minute's time, two police officers were fatally injured. Uh, the chief of police at the time, Harold Melby, put out a teletype, which now it sounds antiquated, but a teletype back in the 1960s was uh, technology. Kind of like a, kind of like a, a text. Yes. Yeah. It was a text message. Right. And uh, he announced to all of the police departments, in defense of law and order, the Camden Police Department had lost two officers and officers responded to those funerals as far away as LAPD for the first time uh, from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, the city of Philadelphia sent two busloads of police officers to the funeral so that they could uh, uh, relieve the officers on duty to attend the funeral. Uh, so it, it kind of served as a cohesion type incident uh, for law enforcement and worth noting in the title, I thought. Uh, so, in so, so those are very meaningful words for you in a very, in a Means very a lot. real way. Means a lot. Uh, the second part of the question, does law and order need need defending today? I, certainly. Uh, I think it's uh, a, a issue that is in the forefront as we look at uh, the last couple of years, what has happened uh, through Ferguson with that uh, incident and later in New York uh, with the choking incident uh, that we saw and then Charlotte. Um, also showed that law enforcement is under scrutiny and uh, there is a defense issue that needs to be defined by uh, both law enforcement and the community that they serve. What do we want from our police officers? Now, the community that you served, uh, you, you were born in Camden. I was born in Camden Cooper Hospital, right. 1950. Okay, and as we said in the introduction, your dad was on the Camden Police Force for 27 years. You mm -hmm. served for 30. Yeah. Uh, you know Camden as well as as anyone. Yeah. Let's well, yeah. let's let's talk about Camden a little bit. Camden is a, a good microcosm, I think, of when people think uh, of a shorthand for for urban blight, for things that have gone wrong in American cities. I think Camden's always mm -hmm. uh, right there at the forefront. Tell us about the good old days, first of all. You were telling me about a city of neighborhoods and how you remember, you know, a, yeah. a, a very lovely place to grow up. The, the, the city, to me, was uh, uh, a um, series of streets that just people lived on that you knew everybody by name. I lived in a row house, which now we call that a townhouse, uh -huh. but a row house where you had neighbors that would help to uh, ensure that the, the kids grew up properly. Uh, in my row, there was the Burrises, the, the Hollowell, the Coachers, the Molinos, the Fitzgeralds, the DiCarlos, and I could name every house, and we used to walk down the al uh, alleyway and just smell the food for the afternoon dinner, and if it smelled real good, we would ask that, that son or daughter, could hey, we, could we eat with could you? We, could we have and, some? Yeah, do you think you have enough for me? And then uh -huh. go home and say, hey, Mom, I'm going to eat over, over Tony's house tonight. Um, 
my grandparents lived three blocks away, uh, so I could walk to their house. Mm -hmm. uh, I could walk to my other grandparents' house that lived about eight blocks away. Mm -hmm. I could name all the police officers each block who lived in what house. Um, for the very uh, quaint community oriented, that if you did something a couple blocks away, your mother knew about it by the time you came home. Right. They met you at the door and said, have a seat on the couch until your dad comes home. Hmm. Um, so everyone knew the rules. But, but then things, things went wrong in Camden. Mm -hmm. And I know you told me that you know, most urban centers have always had crime. Uh, one of the interesting, one of the really, I laughed out loud moments in, in, in your book was when you mentioned that Davy Crockett himself mm -hmm. was mugged in Camden in yes, 1834. Yes, he was visiting yeah. on his he way. Passing through and yes, he was passing through the Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and he was enjoying uh, his dinner, and afterwards they were shooting for a competition, mm -hmm. and while they were shooting, someone picked his pocket. No kidding. Yeah, in the city of Camden, mm -hmm. so Davy Crockett lives. All right, well, let's, so let's talk about Camden. At, at the middle of the last century, the population of Camden was 120,000. Mm. Uh, it's about 70,000 right now. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's lost about 40% of its population. Uh, a lot of things have gone wrong. You actually go back 90 years. You say that, that Camden, Camden's decline began when the Ben Franklin Bridge was built in 1926. Mm. Can you really make that, that, yeah, that claim? Uh, well, you, you hear a lot about urban sprawl, and urban sprawl uh, was usually um, connected with about the 1950s, 1960s. However, in the city of Camden, uh, which was actually a uh, a area for recreation for Philadelphia, which was basically Quaker. So you would come across the ferry boat from Philadelphia, and you would drink your beer in your beer gardens, mm -hmm. and then you would go back to Philadelphia at night. And so Camden was like the the fun side of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and the, the the bridge with a lot of controversy being built kind of split the neighborhood. Uh, from the north section of the city down to about Linden Street, which was one of the main corridors to the waterfront. And you claim that that's a wall that really has never been, been Never reached. done away with that. It had created a, uh, a wall that kind of uh, allowed that one community to be uh, separate from the rest of Camden. Right. And uh, with very, very few streets that lead up to there. Uh, if you take a ride into Camden and you go up to State Street, you'll mm -hmm. see all those homes are three-story houses or all your doctors and your lawyers mm -hmm. of, of this area. Remember now, Camden goes back uh, quite a ways, and the forefathers of the city actually wanted Camden to be as large as Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. it, the northern part of the city actually went into Del Air, New Jersey, which is part of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Camden is the largest landowner in township of Pennsylvania. And it was called the City Invincible? Yes. It's the city where Walt Whitman spent many years. Absolutely. It was is. the home of RCA. Yes. It still is the home of Campbell Soup. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it has a, a, a glorious history. Mm. But things, I'm, I'm, I guess there's a lot of blame to go around. There's a lot of finger pointing we can do. The GI Bill is signed in 1944, allows people to buy houses in places like Levittown, where mm -hmm. I grew up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, $99 down, $99 a month, and people were moving out of Camden and out of Philadelphia, as, as my family did when I was very young. And um, interstate highways are being built. The Cherry Home Mall was built in, what, 1961, 62, right. and all these other, these, mm -hmm. these pulling factors that were mm -hmm. pulling people out until really it got to the point where most of the people that stayed in Camden were the ones that couldn't afford to get out. Mm. There's, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, you, I would suggest to you that even Route 70 and 38, there, there are uh, people around that can still remember when they were dirt roads. And so transportation wasn't that well established as it is today. Um, going in, in the summertime for vacation from Camden, you would go to Blackwood. Mm -hmm. Blackwood, New Jersey is a 20 minute ride today, mm -hmm. and it's located of another college, uh, of, of Camden County College. However, that was the recreation area for the city residents. They didn't go as far as the shore, hmm. even. Yeah, Atlantic City was too far to travel with those cars in those days. Um, by the 1950s, Kingston Estates and Cherry Hill, most of your people that worked at um, both the Campbell Soup mm -hmm. and uh, the corporation you mentioned, and also uh, for RCA, mm -hmm. lived in, they were first to move out into the Kingston Estates uh, in Cherry Hill. Now, that's, that's interesting, too, because you claim in your book that that for a city to thrive, its workers ideally should live 
in the city. Yeah. And who was given permission to leave the city first? Was it the uh, teachers I'll, I'll or tender the... to you that uh, first was the, the teachers. Mm -hmm. The teachers, by contract, were able to live outside the city. Mm -hmm. And next, the police and fire, which were governed by contract that were voted on by the citizens, voted that they should be allowed to live outside the city as well. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, you, you're losing a large portion of your workforce because then public works and the water department and other uh, officials of the city were also allowed to move out of Camden. And I guess the theory is, is that someone goes home from work and has dinner and probably doesn't want to go back into the well, city. Well, would you want to go back? A kids yeah. little again. Yeah, sure. If I lived in, uh, let's say I live out in Cherry Hill somewhere or uh, as far out at Vineland, right. and I want to commute to my job, and now uh, my little boy is playing Little League Baseball, mm -hmm. am I going to support the Little League Baseball in Vineland, right. or will I go back to the city right. and show support for that team that's going to play at 5 o'clock in the city? Yeah. It doesn't happen. So, so really you're saying it's, it's almost predictable that Camden, the demise of Camden has occurred the way that it has. Mm. Uh, it, it seems to me that it, it just can't catch a break, that, that baseball field. Mm. Um, is it called Campbell Field, right underneath yeah. the bridge there? Yeah. You know, yeah. that, yes. that team disbanded, I think, overnight mm. uh, last year. I-676, I, I which mm -hmm. was a bypass that people were crying for, um, you know, bypasses the city. It's sure one of those can, situations. Yeah. I guess you should uh, be careful what you wish for. Some, sometimes you might want to bypass and then you finally get it and it turns out sometimes. People, people bypass you. Yeah, and that, that uh, I actually include in the book um, some, what I, I refer to as nails in the coffin uh, for the city and the first being the building of the bridge and that isolated the northern section and it did away with a lot of your ferry boats and then eventually all the ferries were gone mm. and all your main streets lead to the Delaware River and then next to the expansion of Rutgers University mm -hmm. who took over 2nd Street, 3rd, 4th and 5th Street were all passageways into North Camden which was your basic residential area. Mm -hmm. They needed it because they didn't want students injured if they were crossing the street which would a a problem for them and an issue for the city. And so that was a second uh, nail coffin in the coffin of, of Camden for its demise. Uh, everything from State Street moved to Cooper Street. Mm -hmm. uh, all your uh, eye doctors and your, your lawyers moved their operation to another street and then eventually to Market Street and then eventually with the Cherry Hill Mall that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, they moved out of town right. and never came back. Will will anything will Camden come back? Uh, you have you have Rutgers University right downtown, but that almost seems like a little fortress in itself. Mm -hmm. You have the Victor apartment building I've noticed, uh, which are being marketed as, you know, mm -hmm. very high style living, yeah, upscale condominiums. Um, so do you do you see a future for Camden? Oh or, sure, uh, sure. I, there's a future for for the city. Uh, there, it, it's just that it, it's going to take time. It took time to. Uh, tear the city down in, in a way, mm -hmm. and now it's going to take time to build the city back to what it was. Uh, the, the method now seems to be, well, we're we'll entice businesses into the city and give them a tax break for a number of years, and maybe the workers will move closer to the city, and then that will lead to uh, more restaurants and activity for the people who work at those new corporations, and then we'll see a, a, a viable life brought back into an old town. And how long does something like that take? I don't know. Is that a few years or is that a few generations? I would think we're looking at uh, quite a few years. It took quite a few years to get to where we are now. Yeah. And it's going to take a few years to bring it back. Uh, Charlie, we have about a minute before we have to go into a break. In that, in that minute, what are, what are some of the reasons that, that, that you wrote this book? Give us a general well, I think, outline I think and we'll come back and discuss yeah. it afterwards. Uh, I stepped down from the dean position and I had the time, uh, finally, because I think all of us always say, I, I think I ought to write a book. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons. The other was uh, because the police department uh, was kind of disbanded uh, and reformed in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I felt a need to uh, document those 140 plus years that uh, the Camden Police Department was in existence. So I took the time to uh, put something down, write them down on paper. And it's a very, uh, it's a very lively book. It might might seem surprising to some people, but I know I was reading some bits and pieces of it out loud to my wife. You, 
it's a shout out to a lot of people. There's a lot of names in there. You, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can even picture some of the. There was a guy named Fussy. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. think of what his name was. Yeah. And uh, you love to describe the changes in the uniforms mm -hmm. and the badges mm -hmm. and uh, you know the, the yeah. patrols and just some of the the, the history. It, of, it, of the it's it's important. Force. I think. I think that uh, that that create the culture around any organization. It's right. your history, and history is important. Even the decal that's on the front of the book. Uh, was something I designed for the department. Uh, it was modeled after the city of uh, New York, hmm. and it, it captured on the inside part of it, it's a seven colored patch that you'll see on the cover, uh, that it captured the uh, city emblem and the, the little locomotive that Camden had the first train, and Camden had the first this and that. It's almost like the city of Philadelphia, right. the city of first. Um, and that history is being lost. Mm -hmm. So you're doing everything you can to keep it we're trying. in the forefront. Yes. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. I would like to talk about some law enforcement issues uh, facing us over the past couple of years and in the very near future. So stick around over the break, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Larry Kane in the Cumberland Mall. All the best to everybody at Cumberland County Community College. Your success begins there. Thanks for staying with us for the second half of Insights. I'm Kevin McGarvey, and my guest is Dr. Charles Kocher. Uh, Dr. Kocher, I was looking on the internet. I was reading some of the, uh, sort of an overview of the president's task force on 21st century uh, policing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, uh, from what I read, that the central question is how do you promote effective crime reduction while building public trust? That seems to be, you know, if everything that I've read and hear uh, put together. How do you how do you reconcile those two those two things? It's a million dollar question. However, I think you can break it down into several parts. Uh, law enforcement uh, had to do a better job at solving crime and preventing crime, and the um, vehicle they're using now to do that is community policing. And community policing is a proactive approach uh, to policing. They're kind of creating what we talked about in the community that's not there anymore. They don't live in a city, so now they have to go back and establish themselves as police officers within that community. Well, could you, could you go back, could you define what community policing Community means? policing um, is actually a administrative term for uh, enforcement, a, a method for the police department to enforce the laws. Uh, although it sounds enticing that the community is involved somehow, but we're, we're creating that community. The, the police officers are, are taking part in different types of activities, so baseball or basketball, where they're uh, having a barbecue, and they're trying to reestablish themselves to being trustworthy within that community, mm -hmm. at the same time that there's respect for law enforcement, and that that respect requires the community to understand who are our police officers that are there. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's a, a program that came out of Rutgers University with uh, George Kelling and uh, caught fire mm -hmm. and led to other theories after it. Mm -hmm. But uh, we hear a lot about community-oriented policing, mm -hmm. which was a term from Bob Trojanowicz in 1986, who was a sociologist and knew that somehow we had to bring the police department back to the community. And how we do it, who knows? Well, this, um, this goes back to what we were saying in the first segment, too. If you have a, a police officer who's walking the streets, even if he or she is walking the streets, and then at 5 o'clock or at the end of a shift goes to you know, a suburban home 15 miles away, that sends a signal. Yes, it's um, a different type of signal. And at my house, my dad was a cop, so it was not unusual to have somebody come to the door seven o'clock at night and say, mm -hmm. Mr. Coach, or I just ran over a cat, or this happened to my house, mm -hmm. and he would have to take an action while he was not working. So um, that's the neighborhood cop right. that was in the block. Okay, so community policing really is uh, sort of a collaboration? It's like, a, like an interweaving of the Yes, it's uh, a collaboration community. to bring it back to what, what it was mm -hmm. prior to 1950. And is this a nationwide effort? Do you think that, that most police forces in the country see that as a, as a goal? 
It's yes and no. Uh, the urban centers, yes. The suburban police departments will tell you we've been doing this all along mm. um, because their officers live in their communities where they, they work. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've never gotten away from the community. However, in your inner cities, that's where you see it. Mm -hmm. uh, Atlantic City, for example, in our state, uh, tried to provide housing for the police officers so they would move back in at a lesser rate mm -hmm. for rental, and it did not work. It did uh -huh. not bring them back. You said to me that there were six pillars. Now, I'm not going to put mm -hmm. you on the spot and ask you to remember all six, but what are, what are the, the, the basics? Of the, the, the basic the there is uh, community policing at one. Mm -hmm. uh, to the, the whole report that came out in, 19, in 2015 kind of regurgitated the 1960 report from LBJ on policing and on corrections and the courts and everybody, everybody else that's in this whole system. Mm -hmm. And the 2015 report identifies six pillars for training, for education, for community policing, for enforcement, uh, for police department to build around for their vision statement and for the goals and objectives. And it, it looks good. It looks good mm -hmm. starting. It's kind of uh, early yet. Uh, to have a whole nation buy into this thing, mm -hmm. but it, it, in stages it should work. Mm -hmm. um, education's a big area. Um, the, the idea of how old should a police officer be? Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Philadelphia just changed the entrance age to 24, so a little bit more maturity. Mm -hmm. uh, from that, at 19, it's been used for most departments in the area. Uh, so they're looking to change the culture. They're looking to change the image of policing mm -hmm. and see if it's going to be a warrior type individual mm -hmm. or do we want as a society a guardian type individual that yeah that, that was actually one of my questions a guardian or or warrior peacemaker or or enforcer what mm -hmm. what should the police officer of the 21st century be and that's going to be defined by the community it says what do they want and then community policing is basically an arm of that and becomes the proactive approach so how will we bring crime down? Mm -hmm. How will we reduce crime in certain areas? Crime overall is down. But people, people don't, don't realize that. They don't no. believe that when you tell uh, them. Personal crimes, uh, robbery, burglary, mm -hmm. uh, property crime but burglary, but robbery being a personal crime, are mm -hmm. up. Combine the two together and it looks like crime rates coming down. Right. I just read this morning, uh, Chicago had recorded its 700th murder yesterday and uh, Los Angeles and New York together, which has uh, a population five times that of Chicago, has, I think, 300 fewer. Mm -hmm. So murder, for example, is at an all-time low, 50-year uh, low mm -hmm. in most of the country. Mm -hmm. But there's just a few exceptions, you know, in Baltimore, yeah. in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, you know, there are different theories and philosophies, and I'm sure you, you teach these in, mm -hmm. your, in your classes. The broken windows theory, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this was popularized, I guess, in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Bratton was the police chief in New York, and mm -hmm. this is when Rudy Giuliani was the mm -hmm. mayor. The broken windows theory, I explain Broken windows explain theory is to take care of the lessers, and then the greater won't happen. So in a building, a broken window, repair that, and your heater won't burn out, uh, or the floor won't be damaged with water from the rain coming in that window. So take care of the lessers. Now, apply it to law enforcement. Uh, take care of your kids on the corner, the loud noise, the graffiti on the wall. The, the squeegee guy. The squeegee guy at meet you at the, at the border of New York. Uh, it won't occur. Mm -hmm. uh, the major crime won't occur. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very aggressive policing. Right. This is that uh, community policing proactive method. Mm -hmm. Stop the crime before it occurs. Remember now, law enforcement from the beginning, 1829, was reactive. Um, we started out with a light going on, you see the lights on, or they go find out, oh, uh, the coach your house is, has a problem, then respond to that. Everything is respond. Mm -hmm. It's uh, late, it's a late report. Uh, proactive policing stop the crime before it occurs. And going back just to the broken windows theory for a moment, uh, someone like Giuliani takes credit for that and obviously sees that as a, as a great success, but you yourself use the word aggressive. I'm sure some people right. see it as being extremely aggressive and possibly, you know... Uh, Overly aggressive. Yeah. And they stop it in to, New York. Yeah. Yeah. And that gets into uh, court decisions. You have uh, Terry versus Ohio for your stop and frisk. Uh, can I approach you and just uh, pat you down for weapons without a reason? And the public doesn't want that. So that's what I mean by defining what do we want from our law enforcement? How far can they go to protect the citizens 
uh, in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And that, that become a, a cliche too of called quality of life issue. And uh, what is the quality of life that that community wants? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we define that? And that's different. Can you sit on your step? Can you walk to the corner store without having your hat broken into? Right. Okay, so, so in, in real terms, how can we improve relations between people, real people, and, and the police? I think you've got to start with your people skills, your communications. Uh, the police officers have to speak to the community uh, more openly and tell them what they're doing and why. They need to be a philosophy, not a program, because a program has a beginning and it has an end. But a philosophy is embedded and never goes away. So if that philosophy is to have good communication, we won't have to fabricate it with a cookout or with a stage uh, event with law enforcement uh, doing something with the community. That it happened naturally mm -hmm. and that it doesn't happen unnaturally. Um, it, it, it just needs to have that communication and that skill needs to be embedded in the new officers. We screen out very well police officers. We want the best. Camden's best, Byron's best, Bridgeton's best. But we, we might be screening out good candidates that can speak well, too, or get along with kids. Our society's getting older. We have a geriatric community mm -hmm. that's getting older. Officers need to respond to that. So you have different generations. We talked about um, before we came out here about Generation X and the different generations mm -hmm. and the boomer, baby boomer generation, which we're part of, and now the well, new generation. You just, you just presented it. Um, a paper in mm -hmm. New Orleans. You were telling me um, about the millennial generation yes. and police use of yeah, excessive and, force. And that's a new uh, whole factor for law enforcement to understand that when I respond to that house, I might be talking to someone from the greatest generation. I might be talking to someone from uh, the uh, boomer generation, or I might be talking to the X generation, or possibly a millennial who has the helicopter parents and everything else involved with. Right. The police officer has no training in that. We need to give them that sensitivity training, that diversity, so that they understand exactly what they're up against. And then when you put that extra factor of a emergent problem on top of that, that your, your adrenaline is pumping and you're not thinking clearly, the officer has to take charge and understand that what generation am I talking to? And they're, it's not just one or the other. Remember, there's half of one, half of another. So there's half of an X generation with a boomer and half of X with a millennial, and, and each one kind of uh, overlaps another generation. Mm -hmm. And this is important, and this, this is what comes out with that respect uh, that the officers want, but that they earn it. Thank you. We have about one minute left, uh, amazingly enough. Talk about the criminal justice program here at the college. What exciting things do we have going on right now? Very active program. Uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have our own uh, online degree mm -hmm. in criminal justice. We have uh, programs ongoing all the time. It's a lot of hands-on, so we do forensics uh, in our program. and the, the students learn about DNA and collection and basic uh, police work, but it's not a police program. It's a law enforcement criminal justice studies program. What does that mean? We're, we're seeing if you're interested in law, are you interested in the courts, are you interested in corrections, or maybe policing, but it's not just police. And we also have collaborations with some four-year four -year universities on campus? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're close to Wilmington University and Fairleigh Dickinson University. Mm -hmm. We have our, our students also respond well to Rowan University in Stockton mm -hmm. and, and have actually attended John Jay and St. John's University in New York. So our kids have been getting in there wherever they want to go. Great. So they just need to call the college's main number, which is 856-691-8600, and ask uh, for information about criminal justice, and uh, that caller will be directed to Dr. Kocher. Great. Dr. Kocher's book is uh, called Camden Police in Defense of Law and Order. It is available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, at the College Bookstore as well. Dr. Kocher, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. This has been Insights. We will see you next time.